Hey everybody, Eric here. I got Dave again, and I figure what what better timing with everything that we're seeing going on in the marketplace to kind of talk to the man that's pretty plugged in and you know learn a little bit more what you're seeing in the landscape. So first off, welcome back. Great to have you again. I'm glad you know last time didn't scare you away. Yeah, <laughs> well, thanks for having me. No, really appreciate it, and you know appreciate you and your your audience and the the interest in what we're doing. So uh, happy to talk about it. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. So we have kind of a cool agenda today. I gave you, you know, just like a brief run through of some of the things that I wanted to cover. But, you know, to start off, last time we spoke a lot about fiscal policy, you know, what the Fed involvement in the market has looked like, and essentially how we've essentially gone off the playbook. We're starting to do a lot of things that, well, we, um, you know, the Fed is starting to do a lot of things that we just hadn't really seen before, and we're not exactly sure where it leads us. So I thought, what better way to pick up than, you know, resuming that conversation, because we're starting to see some of the Fed's thoughts, the minutes are coming out, or what was it t- today or tomorrow that they come out from last month? Yeah, 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 the, right, yeah. yeah the, the minutes are coming out soon. We, we have a pretty big meeting scheduled, what, for next month, mid-March? where we're expecting a rate raise and all those kinds of things. So I'd love to just start there and get your general thoughts on the current state of the marketplace as a whole, and then even just maybe a little broader, what the economic picture looks like to you. We don't have to stay in one bucket or the other, just whatever comes to your mind. Sure. You know, I got to remember this for next time. I got this great t-shirt and it says, I survived the Fed rate hike of 2015 because at the time it felt like it was a pretty big deal. And it shows you like rates going down, down, and then down. And then like at the bottom, there's just like this little bloop right up you know. when they hiked in 2015. And obviously, you know, they, they ended up undoing that. Um, so it, it's funny I, because the last time we spoke, I, I remember this was what we ended on, as you're saying. And I, to- I told you I was team transitory. Um, and I remain, I will say, I remain team transitory, um, and I, I sort of defer to economists who know a whole lot more about this than I do. Um, I do have a background in economics, but um, I'm not immersed in it on a day-to-day basis, so I mostly, you know, I, I kind of separate in, in terms of my knowledge. I separate the, the things that I study on a regular basis from you know, the things other people study and I learned from on a regular basis and, and economics is, is probably in that, that second bucket. But, um, you know, I, I think when you, when you sort of look at the inflation numbers, uh, the, the argument against them, against it being transitory is that it's not really being calculated correctly uh, mm. and that it is much worse than the number is, you know, than the headline number of seven and a half percent makes it out to be. And I think Bill Ackman, you know, has tried to make that particular case um, and saying that rental and uh, I think rental prices are not being accounted for correctly. And he had some other points on that. Um, and then when you look at it from the sort of transitory perspective, when you pull up, first of all, sort of assuming CPI is being calculated uh, correctly and, and representative of what of the price pressures that people are facing, then like when you pull out used cars, <laughs> Uh, it drops dramatically. And so, you know, the, right. if you're not buying a used car, your CPI is probably pretty significantly different. And now, you know, yeah, we're facing the highest uh, rate of food inflation that we've seen in a long time. But then again, we, we saw, you know, those numbers drop a lot uh, as the, the sort of pandemic set in and such. So again, I, I think we're going to start to see inflation slow down significantly. I think this was probably the highest print. That's what the people who I respect the most in economics are saying. Um, and I think that's that's probably what the Fed thinks. I would I would say that there's a, an economist, Claudia Sam, uh, who I find to have great analysis. She worked at the Fed for a long time. Uh, she's very active on Twitter. And, and I, I, I find her analysis to be some of the more compelling analysis out there. So um, you know, I'm kind of just talking about a lot of the things that she's been talking about, but um, I, you know, from her perspective, she thinks that the Fed is looking at all this very closely, uh, that they're not going to overreact. A lot of people are saying, let's, let's have an emergency meeting next week. Let's get a rate hike fast. Um, I, I will say that I find it surprising that they're not 
stopping asset purchases, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's another 20 billion for this month and they haven't signaled that they're stopping that. If, if I was, you know, in their shoes, which I'm obviously not, I, I would have assumed by now that would have ended maybe before they had indicated it would end uh, at the very least. Cause yeah, I agree that there's a rate hike coming. That should be no surprise. Everyone seems to agree on that. There's a big question on how much and how many. Uh, she thinks it's 25 basis points. You know, some people think 50 will be the first one. I, I, I don't know what the answer is. I, I don't know how markets are going to react because you're right. We're, this is unprecedented. We are in unprecedented situation and unprecedented conditions. Um, markets are getting a bit more volatile, it seems. Um, we're seeing some, yeah. you know, they're, they're kind of seesawing now. We're seeing tech names really sell off when they, when they have bad news. Um, so, uh, you know, all that is indicative to me that we're, we're, we're potentially going through sort of a regime change in markets, right? It, you know, it's sort of the, is bad news, good news, or is bad news, bad news. And it's starting to become the bad news is now bad news again. Um, and that's a, a big difference that you see generally more in a bear market than a bull market. Um, but you know, it, <laughs> I've been wrong about that before for sure. Uh, so you know, it's, I think, I think people that are forecasting right now, uh, I find that, I find it hard to trust almost anyone. I, I don't think anyone really knows what's going to happen over, you know, and what's going to unfold as the Fed tries to, to, you know, end asset purchases and emerge from zero and straight policy. It's, it's going to be fascinating, that's for sure. <laughs> Yeah, I'm still riveting. It's just seeing what happens here. It's just a riveting story. And, and I, it's like we were talking about last time, right? Like we really have no idea how this ends, how the market reacts. I mean, I've been blown away with how the markets look right now in light of, you know, kind of the Fed tightening discussions. There's the whole Ukraine Russia thing going on, yes. and right there's that, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And like the market is like surprisingly not dropping, you know, it's just, it, yeah. it's Agreed. very interesting to me how anytime you think you might be able to identify how the market might react to things. And then it just market just closed uh, and it's up a little bit. <laughs> See like See? that. I just don't get that. Right. And I mean, you know, this is like uh, 24 hours where almost all the talk has been about a potential war that's starting. Yep. Uh, and the set, the kind of sanctions that would be levied on Russia in the midst of that, you know, I am watching oil pretty closely. Yeah, um, it's near and, it's near highs, near like yeah, what three yeah. year, five year highs. Right. Yeah, and that's gonna be driving, you know, that that does help to drive inflation, but it also, you know, has a big, a pretty big impact, you know, economic, a broad economic impact. And and you know, if Russia does invade and the US levies intense sanctions and so does the world, and the price of oil really spikes, um, you know, that might be the thing that kind of cuts the market off at the knees. Um, yeah, I think right. something I've been considering a lot too is if things with Russia, you know, well, they started pulling back some of the troops off the border. So a lot of people thought that was kind of a, you know, a dovish sentiment that they might be trying to reconcile peacefully. I think that was kind of part of what we saw in the market sure, yesterday. So, yeah. But what I find to be even more interesting is as NATO is starting to kind of do the rallying call and get everybody um, aligned. I think it puts China in a fascinating position. And to me, that's really something that would just absolutely drop the hammer on just the economy in general right now is if China started to side more with Russia, if Russia was making if its movements, you know, just in opposition, essentially the Western powers and whatnot, obviously all conjecture, nobody knows. But yeah. I do think, you know, if we see China's name starting to get involved. I can't think of many places where our economies are more intimately intertwined. And, you know, if relationships with them starts deteriorating further, I can only imagine what that looks like. I, I agree. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think it's like this, it is a situation at the very least of kind of mutually assured destruction, right? Like uh, yeah. China holds so many, so much of our debt that you know a problem for us is certainly a problem for them and it might be the only thing that that keeps things sane because i i think you're right that china is the thing to watch and it's the thing that i think everyone around the world is trying to to separate from 
and that's you know practically impossible um i think there are you know sort of the greatest geopolitical rival that we face and you know certainly economic rival and it's only going to get worse so um you know i i think from from that perspective they've got a lot of levers that they could pull that would be extremely bad for us but like yeah. i said in doing that they they would be cutting off the nose to spite the face because you know they've got just as many entanglements into our economy as we have into theirs yeah that's and yeah that's it's just another one of those the further you look at it because i mean obviously from like the geopolitical power side of things there's one perspective but then once you start understanding how the economies are so so intertwined and dependent on one another because a lot of people i think in the u.s understandably we see you know a lot of things made in china around the house and a lot of people kind of just assume that that means china it has a just overall dominant economy that's overwhelmed the u.s I think obviously there's more to that story, especially once you start looking further at GDP and the kind of products that are moving and the level of um, technology that's being sold externally and things like that, that, you know, there's a disparity there that I don't think is as commonly known, but I just feel like the relationship between the two countries is just that if one starts doing any sort of significant sanctions, opposed to the other. I I just see it going downhill very fast right after that. I think so too. And you know, I think it's a it's a huge priority in the US to decouple from China. And I think that that should be something that, that yeah. people pay way more attention to and that we pour way more resources into. I think one of our greatest sort of political failings is not making that one of the top issues in the country. Um, and so, you know, I think if we could uh, from sort of a supply chain perspective and, and a manufacturing perspective to couple far more so from China, we would be in, in a much greater position because it would be worse for them as significant holders of our debt uh, right. than it would be for us. Yep. If anything, yeah. go down. That, that's a really good point. Um, so there was a couple things that you brought up earlier that I wanted to make sure I circled back to, one of which was some of your econo your favorite economic sources of information on Twitter. I would be remiss if I didn't get a list of some of those people. I know that you already mentioned Claudia. Um, do you have anybody else that you would recommend, you know, if people just want to follow broader scale economics a little closer, anybody else that you'd recommend? Um, you know, it's funny. I, like, I, yeah, I follow people from sort of, all across the spectrum, um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I I, <laughs> I, 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 wouldn't necessarily endorse a lot of them per se. Sure. But I really, I really find that getting other perspectives is is worthwhile. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like uh, Matt Stoller as an example, who is someone who really focuses on monopoly and 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 corporate concentration. I find a lot of his analysis to be absolutely fascinating. Uh, extremely in depth and well supported. Um, he's, you're, you know, if, if you're not a liberal, you might not like him. He's very left. Uh, the same thing as uh, someone called Noah Smith, who, uh, you know, is is very liberal. Um, but but I, I find him to be pretty measured when it comes to economic analysis. Um, so you know, I, I think uh, off the top of my head, you know, when I that's most of what I tend to see okay. um, in my stream. You know, there's um, Rohan Gray is another another pretty good one who's he's very much focused uh, more on sort of um, you know like tech and digital currency. Oh, cool issues. But he, you know, he, a lot of these a lot of these people are. I, 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 what I really like what is when I read some of these analysis of modern monetary theory, and, and even in that left-leaning group, you get a, sort of a very diverse set of perspectives um, and, and opinions on modern monetary theory, which is essentially like what we've been trying as a response to the pandemic. And for many of them, you know, they, they I mean, you, you get you get both perspectives, but Claudia, I think, for example, would consider um, this to be a triumph of modern monetary theory um, and, you know, a demonstration that you can really kind of print your way out of a crisis without uh, 
huge repercussions. And, you know, people might say, well, what about the inflation? But, you know, the, the, the inflation that we're seeing, again, if it ends up being transitory, is sort of an expected outcome of a, um, you know, it's sort of like a, it, it's more of a supply chain issue than a monetary policy quick, issue. Quick question on that, sorry. Um, just, just for the, the transitory component, I am curious because, but like last time we talked about it, I was doing actually a bunch of research to try to get some ideas in terms of like what transitory inflation actually looks like. And I feel like that's just another area where people like me might have a really skewed perspective without looking at like a broader picture, right? Because I've been, like I said, I, I've been trading since like 2007, so my exposure to inflation is relatively small, right, compared to just longer market durations and whatnot. So I would be really curious just to understand when you think of transitory inflation, like what are some of the defining features of that for you as you have a conversation about it? Because I feel like a lot of people look at inflation right now and they're like, well, it's not transitory. It's been here for two months. You know what I mean? Like they kind of think it's sure. been here for yeah. a few months. Or so even three quarters, right? I right. Mean, you know, yeah. You know, I think that um, I, the way that it's been described to me is that it's a question of, is it supply side inflation? Is it being driven by supply side or demand side? Um, mm. and if it's driven by demand side, it, it's potentially more structural because that means it's being fed by, let's say wage inflation and inflation expectations. Whereas if it's being driven by the supply side, it's because suddenly like we're seeing like supply chains have become constricted and tight and materials are hard to get. And so what happens is that then yes, prices rise, but actions are taken because of those higher prices to streamline and improve the supply side. And so it comes back to normal. So I, the, I think the way Claudia put it was it's like an in, inflation impulse, right? It's like, it's an impulse that hits and it can be over a couple of quarters, right? It's not the kind of, like when you say, transitory, it doesn't mean like it's going to be a one month reading of high inflation and then gone, right? It's going to be a curve that, that goes up and then comes back down. And so that's, you know, what we would expect over the next few months is that, you know, hopefully we're at the peak and we start to see it at least level off and then start to come back down. And so then we would look back in a couple of years and we would say, oh yeah, inflation was elevated for two or three quarters and that, that, and, and, or even a year, let's say, because the, the supply chains were completely, you know, screwed up. Uh, and like, you know, given what's happened with COVID and uh, the, the, you know, people not being able to go to work and then, you know, the, the weird sort of uh, hoarding behaviors that we saw, we, you know, we really put our, our supply chains under this in, intense level of stress that I don't think anyone uh, had ever sort of contemplated before, uh, you know, and now, yeah, we all have like a lifetime supply of toilet paper and paper towels, <laughs> but like, you know, we can't get ships to, to dock in the ports of LA fast enough, right? So yeah. it's, all this stuff is, is a very weird situation that we find ourselves in but you know if it's transitory it means things are going to normalize again right i so it's so two things the first one is i you are like the perfect match for like the stereotypical nice canadian people because the way you phrased the awkward hoarding behavior to me i'm thinking just how psychotic human beings can be <laughs> and completely yeah. nonsensical because it's like i don't know i like I get it. Toilet paper is nice. I get it. But I guess for a lot of people, they don't realize like a good portion of the world goes without it. And if there's something <laughs> that I was worried about, it's going to be like water or, or food. <laughs> right, but right. That's just, you know, the typical American. It's They're the like, Western well, problems, you know, I'll, right. I'll worry about food later. Let me get this toilet paper. <laughs> but um, the other thing that I'm actually really glad and I, and I appreciate that explanation because that really falls in line with a lot of what I was reading more in more or less in terms of inflation being transitory is not directly tied to duration. And I think that a lot of people 
immediately feel if it's, you know, here for X period of time, especially people like me, right? Millennials. And it's even worse for younger people where our attention span is like 14 seconds. So if something's been here <laughs> for a day, it's essentially there for eternity, you know? Right, right. And I, yeah, that, that it's just I really, think that's a really good point. And, you know, it, I, I think, um, a, a good, um, maybe a good example, and this is off the top of my head, so it might not, you know, I'd probably have to look deeper into this, but if you think of sort of the stagflationary period of the 70s and early 80s, um, that's a, an excellent example of non-transitory inflation. So OPEC comes together to collude with about on oil prices and keep them elevated for an extended period of time and not to reflect supply demand equilibria, uh, as well as ec economic growth slowing down. And, uh, you know, suddenly you had consistent, extremely high inflation that, you know, there, there are certainly multiple narratives about how it was dealt with, but one of those narratives is that Volcker, you know, spiked interest rates, essentially torpedoed the economy, but got inflation under control. Um, I, I think there are other sort of revisionist history theories as to what, what might have been more effective. And, and so I don't want to speak to that or endorse a view of it. I'm, I'm only bringing it up to say that that's sort of the example of inflation that you would not consider transitory and in which right. action and, and, and significant action was needed uh, in order to address it. And, and so, you know, I don't think that's the case today. I think you, also, you already see Congress um, tightening from a, from a fiscal policy perspective, right? Inflation can be driven by uh, monetary policy, fiscal policy, or, you know, the supply demand conditions. Um, and, you know, if Congress is not going to, to pass like universal basic income or another massive social spending program, um, you know, that, that's going to be a fiscal force for uh, tightening. And you've got the Fed as a monetary source, which will be tightening. And so it's, you know, to me, I, I think it's good that, that we can hope, hopefully, that the Fed will not overreact and that we'll ease into this tightening cycle. Uh, and, you know, if Powell can pull it off, it'll be really just an, an amazing success story of a massive disruption uh, and dislocation to our economy and our world, and one in which, you know, the, the, the Fed responded, managed through it over, you know, frankly, over multiple decades of crisis after crisis, and maybe we're about to come out of it. What do you say, or what's your opinion, I should say, on all of the 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 Bitcoin fanatics that say all of this government manipulation is cured by Bitcoin. What do you think about that? <laughs> um, I, I, I'm not. So the reason I am not a um, retired Bitcoin multimillionaire is because I don't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I owned a whole lot of Bitcoin as early as one. Oh, that's day. right. We talked about that. You yeah. and I both made the same mistake, man. Yeah, I, I bought it at two dollars, uh, but I was never a true believer. I was a trader, and I traded out of it. And I have friends that were true believers, and you know, they can do whatever they want now because they're filthy rich. So, um, but most of those people, they'll they'll just keep holding it anyways. You know, somebody will, will look at it never. And be like, I got, never convert it to fiat. Yeah, yeah I, exactly. I, I got 15 million in there, but it's going to keep going. That's right. They will <laughs> never pay taxes on that. You could kill them before they're going to pay tax <laughs> to the government. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist. I'm not a libertarian. I love crypto. I think it's amazing technology. I think that um, it's got a place in our economy and our market. Um, but does Bitcoin fix this so far not so far it has not been proven to be a an effective inflation hedge uh, agreed so agreed. you know i it's sort of like we're at the point where the proof's in the pudding right like if it is going to fix this and address it it should be doing that it should be going up as inflation goes up which it hasn't because it's just it's a very volatile sort of yeah. you know, asset class and you know, I don't know, maybe 10, 20 years from now, it'll be more stable and it will respond in the way they expect. But I think that's pure conjecture. I think so too. The other thing that I think about is if the idea of Bitcoin is that it's like a, 
universal currency, right? It's border borderless. Inflation changes in different countries at different points in time. So, like, sure. what what happens with that? You know, so, yeah, I I largely agree that there is a place for Bitcoin. I think it's just a really really fascinating. I have Bitcoin right now. Like, I I'm just I'm fascinated by it, and I think that it has potential in certain ways. But I've always been skeptical by you know the really really Bitcoin evangelists that are essentially <laughs> saying, you know, if you have cancer, go get Bitcoin and <laughs> now you're good. You know, yeah, it's just, yeah, exactly. I, I, I have get, a good friend who is one of those and, um, you know, more power to him. He's, he's done pretty well thanks to it, but just tell him to know. sell. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think there's always, I, I like the saying, you know, don't ever confuse uh, luck with skill. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I think that we'll see. And, and I, I do think Bitcoin will, can, will, will be an excellent investment over the long haul. And, and I've got uh, some substantial exposure to different cryptos um, and, you know, some real strong thoughts on uh, where my money is going, which is, you know, I'm not putting new money into Bitcoin. I put it mostly into Avalanche. I, I think Avalanche is a far... Yeah, I remember you uh, told me about it. technology, and yeah, and you know, I'm I, I tend to approach things from a tech perspective more than sort of a, you know, monetary structure perspective. Nerd. <laughs> Proud <laughs> to be one. I'm actually, I don't even know if anyone knows what this EFF shirt is, but they they are uh, a a nonprofit that is standing up for you and your rights to digital online security and privacy. They're safeguarding. Uh, oh, that's dope. technologies from government interference and uh, they are a nonprofit that I'm a strong supporter of and us nerds have to band together and hold the line. Speaking of nerds doing the right thing, did you see the news about Google? They're starting to potentially re I, I didn't read the article all the way through. So I'm probably coming off as 95% ignorant, you know, 5% surplus than my usual. Um, <laughs> but I am it was talking about essentially some user rights adjustments to their current policies. Again, it's very broad, but it, they were comparing it to kind of like what Facebook did with, oh, I'm sorry, what Apple did with some of, you know, like the privacy standards within the marketplace, you know, for like their app store and whatnot. Have you seen any of that yet? It was literally today. So you might not have. I did not see it today. This is okay. probably the perfect seg to talking about the Algorithmic Accountability Act. Um, hey. You know, I... I <laughs> I would, I would not trust Google. Is, there it is. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Um, so, so for, for uh, just a couple minutes, I wanted to pull up some tweets that Dave made mostly because I like looking at his profile picture. It's very dapper, I must say. Um, <laughs> a but, much younger and, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> but much one of, well, you should see any of like my professional photos. It's when I was still clean shaven. I don't have a beard in any of them. So I am like the <laughs> ultimate professional catfish because as soon as somebody sees me after they looked at like my LinkedIn profile, they're like, who the hell is this guy? Um, but anyways, this actually was one of the things I, I really wanted to talk to you about was the algorithmic accountability act, which I was saying, I never heard about that before you kind of like that sweatshirt you're wearing, which I'm gonna check them out afterwards. You're always full of fun things to check out. So anyways, <laughs> you know, I'd love to hear just a little bit more about what you find interesting about the Algorithmic Accountability Act. Yeah, so um, for the last couple of years, I've, I've been uh, involved in the AI space. And I actually, I sit on the editorial board for the Journal of AI and Ethics. And um, you know, the ethical use of AI is something I, I care very deeply about, and the misuse of personal data uh, is also something that I care very deeply about, and it's why mm. everybody who is listening to this should delete their Facebook account uh, right now. Um, what Facebook has done is horrific. They've destroyed civil society, uh, all in the name of Damn. profit, and uh, they've set us against each other, and I think that they have no ethics or morals whatsoever. Um, I got to I'm sorry, I got to ask though, what are like some of the things you're referring to like bundled into that statement? Um, okay. <laughs> so, uh, I wrote a piece on this. Uh, oh, good. Uh, uh, in the journal, it was a, an editorial and uh, in it, you know, I I explained that 
you know, Facebook claims to be about building community and bringing people closer together. But what they really do is they have algorithms that separate us into filter bubbles. And so they control the information that we see. And these algorithms are engineered to maximize engagement. And to maximize engagement, you need to make people angry and outraged. And that is the core of this outrage machine. Oh. And that is the entire business model of Facebook. Um, yeah. I had an interaction with Facebook's chief AI scientist, uh, oh, pretty much just exactly a year ago uh, on Twitter. And he said that I uh, had no idea what, he, what I was talking about and that Facebook's AI solves hate speech, that it solves calls mm. to violence and bullying, and it, it is able to effectively filter out disinformation that endangers public safety or the integrity of the democratic process. So I'll wait while everybody uh, stops laughing. Yeah. Uh, that, just take that, a second. It sounds right up the alley. It sounds like dry your eyes. Doing. That's <laughs> what an absurd thing to claim that your AI can do. Um, <laughs> And so instead of responding to him on Twitter, uh, I wrote this really extensive piece in the Journal of AI and Ethics uh, with a really extensive amount of information and study to show how bad their algorithms are, how they do cause polarization and echo chambers, and to show that um, they're, that it is part of their business. Their business is to get us angry and to make right. us hate each other. It um, makes sense and, too, because if you think about... Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, it just like it popped in my mind, like most of these, you know, TV shows on Netflix and stuff, a lot of them are driven just by drama, like people love drama. So it does not surprise me in any way, you know, what you're saying that a social media platform is applying a similar construct. Yes, that's right. Exactly. And, and you know, they have supported genocide. Uh, they have supported governments uh, acting against their own uh, citizens. They have they have uh, made cyberbullying worse, and they have made us all dumber. And they have made it so that the information we believe is completely divorced from reality. Mm. Um, and well, so, the Algorithmic so Accountability Act is an attempt to start to put some guardrails mm. on algorithms that impact people significantly. And that would apply to Facebook, that would apply to Google search engines, that would apply to Twitter recommendation algorithms, any of these systems uh, that are algorithmically controlling what we see and recommending what we look at uh, would need to have at the very least, you know, impact assessments being done uh, to understand what both what the impact of those algorithms are and what changes to those algorithms would, would entail. And, you know, it's just like, the barest minimum of accountability, uh, but it's the it's the first step towards actually regulating these that you know I think we as a society desperately need. I have two following questions. The first one is is the is your um, paper is it like openly accessible or is is there like a paywall for it? No, oh, no, it's yeah, it is uh, open access, and uh, I'd be happy to send the link along. And if you want, you can link to it. Yeah, I would love to, because I mean, one, I want to read it, but then two, I, I think it'd be really cool for other people to check it out. So thank you. Sure, the yeah. other thing I wanted to ask you is uh, I am generally confused um, as to how to perceive things like Facebook that are opt in, like how much regulation should something be subjected to? that's an opt-in service. You're not forced to use Facebook. You can easily choose not to. So I'm what, like, where does this go when we start seeing more, you know, broader government regulation on these private opt-in entities? I agree with the sentiment to be, you know, abundantly clear. I think the misuse and mischaracterization of information really needs to be addressed, but I am just curious, like what the broader impact in the deeper game is here. Cause government yeah. regulation also has its shortfalls. Totally agree. And, and it's a very fair question. And, and sometimes I do feel like I come off like a, a liberal and I'm first of all, most certainly not. Um, <laughs> and I don't believe the government regulation is the answer to everything or often anything. Uh, that being said, uh, I do believe that um, corporate concentration of power and monopoly is a problem. 
Mm. Um, and Facebook is a monopoly. And not yeah. only are they a monopoly yep. within social media, yep. uh, but they are allowed to acquire something like Instagram or something like WhatsApp. And so they can extend their monopoly power across different verticals. And that's where things get even more problematic. So right. you know, when you talk about uh, regulating Facebook as a monopoly, you want to reduce their economic power. Um, and it's much of the same thing that I talk about in markets and market structure is that we want to address corporate concentration of power. We want to get rid of monopolies and foster competition. And, and I'm a, a very staunch believer that well-regulated competitive systems uh, are the best outcomes that we know of economically. Uh, mm. And so, you know, I would say that it is a problem when existing regulation allows firms like Facebook to acquire the kind of economic power that they have. So sure. it's not necessarily uh, a question of, do we add on more regulation? It's often a question of, can we change existing regulations that were probably written by the companies that have benefited the most from right. them uh, to be better structured to foster competition? And, and that's where I tend to fall on these kinds of things. Got it, I love it. And that makes a lot of sense. I appreciate the clarification. Um, so we got about 15 minutes left, so I would have to start throwing some rapid fire tweets at you. (laughs) So this one, it says, imagine that brokers, well, I get, okay, let me not do, let let me not give you a bad read here. That was a bad read. It's supposed (laughs) to be more like, I think, imagine that brokers, (laughs) right? Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> uh, brokers routing for their own benefit rather than their customers' results in worse execution quality. Who would have seen that coming? And you know, so on and so forth. So I'm curious. You know, you, you were retweeting a Dutch market study, mm-hmm. and that in and of itself, I find interesting. I always find like studies from other countries mm-hmm. interesting because. I always think that there's correlation, but obviously there's, you know, it's not a direct carryover, but I think in this instance, it's kind of direct carryover uh, just for, you know, brokers. But anyways, um, yeah, just talk to me a little bit about this tweet. You know, we've talked a little bit about brokers routing before, but I'd love to get just your broader thoughts on, on, you know, the competition improving outcomes concept of this and so on and so forth. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, I think that this year is going to be a really transformative year uh, in market structure. And one of the mm. most, uh, one of the sort of central issues that is going to be confronted by, by the Securities and Exchange Commission is this idea of what are called order routing inducements. And so when, when a broker gets an order from a retail investor or trader or even from an institutional investor, they have a duty of best execution. And that duty means that they have to get the best possible price given the circumstances uh, of the market at the time. And also that they're allowed to consider other things, not just price. They can consider size, they can consider, um, you know, various uh, different metrics. But as far as retail traders and investors go, the, the general metric that they're held to is price. Um, And so the question is, are brokers routing orders to achieve the aims of best execution, or are brokers routing orders to make more money for themselves through these inducements? And those inducements include payment for order flow, which the wholesalers like Citadel and Virtu pay to retail brokers like Robinhood and Schwab and TD uh, in order to get all those orders into their internal systems, execute against them, trade against them, Uh, and not expose them to the market at large. Um, And the proponents of payment for order flow will continually make this argument that retail has never had it better, they're getting the best possible prices, uh, and that don't touch it. And the SEC is coming, (laughs) and they want to touch it. They want to get rid of it, much like other countries have done. Uh, Europe is considering exactly the same thing. They don't have as much of a payment for order flow uh, problem as the U.S. does. Uh, but but it is still uh, something that they're considering outlawing in Europe as well. Um, And so this Dutch study was commissioned for those purposes because Europe wanted to see, uh, are investors getting the best possible price? And the answer was no. And this is not a surprise. This has been shown before uh, through all sorts of different studies in the US. Uh, And in fact, even uh, this this one retail broker, Public, 
Com, uh, yep. came out with a really interesting piece at the end of last year showing that even under the existing system, they're able to get better prices for their customers when they don't route to these payment for order flow internalizers. Um, and so I think that this issue is going to be front and center, uh, especially over the next month or so. I think March is there's going to be a lot of attention on this in all sorts of ways. And I think the SEC is about to come in and say, we want to, we want to end this practice. And then I think at that point, it, it's going to kick off this battle uh, between the internalizers and the retail brokers on one side and everyone else involved in markets on the other side. Uh, and if, you know, good luck finding somebody who supports the practice who isn't either making money from it or who didn't make their money and their wealth from it in the past. Um, I personally, I, I, I think it's important to note, it, I, it doesn't matter, this issue, has no commercial interest for me whatsoever. I can, I'm not gonna make money one way or the other on how this issue is decided, but I've been uh, arguing against this practice for 11 years now, uh, because I think it's bad for markets, it's bad for institutions, and most of our wealth is in institutions uh, such as mutual funds and pension plans and that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, the market, I believe, needs to work better for institutions. And this would be a way uh, to do that. It's interesting you say that because I think for a lot of retail traders, the narrative, it's exactly as you say, right, where it may not be the the best order flow, but it's better, you know, than what they've seen before. So what do you see if the changes are made, you know, that essentially start reducing um, payment for order flow and things like that? What, what, from a retail trader perspective, what changes do you think trickle down to them? I think outcomes will improve significantly. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's a very simple, straightforward argument, right? What is going to be a better outcome when three firms uh, are competing to give you the best price? or when a thousand firms are competing to give you the best price. Right. It, it, how, how, more, how much simpler can you get? And right. If you believe in capitalism and competition, then you're gonna say a thousand firms, right? And that's what I push for. I push for open competition for order flow. That retail orders uh, should go to a venue, to a transparent venue, where anyone in the market can compete of, over them. And you know what? If Citadel and Virtu are still providing the best possible prices, they will there too. It's right. beautiful in that way, right? But right. you know what? They'll have to face competition from all these other firms. And they're and not going to just everyone will be orders. better off for it. Yeah. And, uh, the other side of it is that there was a good study that was done um, that measured uh, something called toxicity uh, on exchange. And it said, and I, you know, unless you want to get deep into the issue, the, the thing you need to know is that um, the, the orders from retail are not toxic. They are good to trade against. They're easier to make money for market makers. And so um, by pushing those orders onto a transparent venue, you would reduce the toxicity of that venue. And by reducing the toxicity of our lit markets, our exchanges in the US, you would tighten spreads by 25% or more. That's and wild. so what that tells you, yes, what that tells you is that payment for order flow is increasing the costs to trade for everyone in the market by 25%. That's a huge number. Yes. And that's the kind of number that's eroding returns for pension plans, that's adding to fees and mutual funds, and that retail traders and investors are facing too. So, you know, I, I do believe strongly that you get all those orders into a transparent venue and everybody's outcomes would be far better, except maybe for Citadel and Virtu and the retail brokers. Do you do you think that the change will happen? Like, do you think it's it's gaining enough traction to see the adjustment made? Or I think the proposal is going to be made, um, and then I think it's going to be up to uh, the people that support it uh, to be very vocal in supporting it, because the 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 ones that will oppose it are going to be loud. They're going to be organized. They're very powerful interests. They're going to be donating to political campaigns uh, when they already have. Ken Griffin, the CEO of Citadel, is the largest GOP donor in this cycle. 
Um, and so, you know, that's what, that's the, the war that is essentially coming uh, for market structure. But I, I mean, I'm very, I'm very cautiously optimistic. It feels like finally, all of these issues are kind of coming to a head uh, this year. And I, I think it's going to be a pretty big year for markets. Interesting. All right. So we have another tweet. I actually wanted to look at this one next. So I hopefully made it a little easier for you to see. We got about a little less than 10 minutes left. Um, but for this one, it's a press release that you are highlighting from Paxis Global. And essentially, you know, the exciting part, it seems to kind of dovetail off of that conversation where we might start to see an increase in competition in kind of the clearing space. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Does this follow similar logic to what you were kind of just outlining regarding order flow or how do you view this impact to the market? I think it's similar and a little different. So um, okay. again, yes, I, I, I'm just a believer in competition. Um, and, you know, I, I have a traditional sort of capitalist uh, education and background. And so, you know, that's, that's where I'm going to come down on a lot of issues. Um, but what I find so fascinating about Paxos, which I, I learned a lot about uh, recently, and, and I learned a lot about their technology, is that this is not centralized clearing and settlement. Mm. Uh, so today uh, you have the, the NSCC and the DTCC, and that's where trades are settled and cleared. And what's that? those are centralized counterparties. Um, and so everyone on Wall Street has to face off against these centralized counterparties, and they have to have enough margin on hand, enough capital on hand to manage the settlement and clearing process uh, for the entire uh, industry. And having all of that capital and taking the time, today's settlement is T plus two, we're, we're gonna be moving to T plus one in two years. Um, but even there having you know, capital and time held up is a risk. And it's a risk that sort of everybody in the industry faces at a cost that everybody in the, in the industry faces. And uh, what Paxos has done is they've created a blockchain based technology uh, that essentially allows for counterparties to face off against each other. And that decentralized model, I find very exciting. It's part and parcel of, you know, what can blockchain technology do? Um, and where does it make sense to use it versus, uh, let's say, a database, for example? Um, and this is one of those, I would say, relatively few examples of where blockchain actually makes sense um, and where the tech uh, is moving along. And, you know, so they got a no action letter from the SEC a couple of years ago. They proved out that they can do this uh, in equities trading and settlement. And, you know, now they have applied to be uh, a registered clearing agency and they would be the first new clearing agency uh, in over 10 years, which is, that's, I, I find that exciting. <laughs> that's what I wanted to highlight, actually. Like, I, this part is really what drew me to this tweet is, Exactly that. It's always an interesting indicator of what a current, you know, niche looks like when entry looks like that, where right. nobody has entered in a decade. Yeah, and right. yes. you know, I that that is very, very interesting to me. So do you think that blockchain technology will give them at least space to compete in the current clearing space? Or I, like what I do think you think so, that looks yeah. like? I think I think so. And I think what's what's even more interesting about the way that they have approached this uh, is that they've done it under the current securities laws. And it's getting it would get very deep and detailed. I won't pretend to know uh, as as like an expert, uh, you know, like the people at Paxos, but um, there there are other attempts to do this which would require rewriting securities laws. Uh, mm -hmm. But the way that they have done this, it would not. And so to me, that's what's most compelling is that they can come in, fit within the current framework and build a better system uh, that can better track securities, better track shares as potentially as they're shorted and lent out and, and delivered, uh, as well as reducing uh, the risk and cost in terms of time and, and capital required. So uh, all of this strikes me as significant efficiencies that the industry can gain. And, you know, a, a lot of retail is very concerned around the opacity and what they perceive as the corruption of the current uh, settlement and clearing agencies. 
um, you know, and without coming down on any side of that issue, you know, this is the kind of thing that maybe will give uh, a lot of people more confidence in the system. And, and I think that's important as well. Yeah, I, I think that's a beautiful summary, especially because when we talk about blockchain, a lot of people think, you know, immediately cryptocurrencies, but mm -hmm. this yeah. is one of the things that I talk about with one of my friends who's in the space. He comes on the channel every once in a while, and he often brings up the application of blockchain technology to other, you know, spheres to, to your point that might even make, I, I wouldn't say more sense, but equal to sense at least as, right. you know, right. some of the cryptocurrency arguments. Yeah. And, and crypto is, you know, when you talk cryptocurrencies, you're talking usually talking about sort of uh, permissionless, trustless, distributed ledger technology, mm -hmm. which are a lot of buzzwords, I know. But, you know, it, it, we don't have time to do a whole lesson on blockchain and, and le distributed ledger technology. But, um, you know, this is not that, in fact. This right. is a piece of blockchain technology, the smart contract piece, because you you don't need a system here that's descent, that's de that's distributed or trustless because the people that would be engaging are all regulated entities and you know you you they, it needs to be permissioned uh, right. but when you have this smart contract technology that can allow what are called atomic swaps suddenly you know that is is a real step forward um, and so that's what i i find to be so fascinating about what their approach has been yeah i, I love it um, the next tweet you have here and it's the last one uh, for this before kind of closing up, but I just wanted to let you know that I vehemently disagree with this. I'll never be able to put another successful trade on if I can't simply <laughs> copy Nancy Pelosi. So this is not only selfish of you, um, and it is devastating to the vast majority of retail traders. <laughs> I'm sorry. All I can say is I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I just can't stand corruption. And I mean, I, I think much to the detriment been, of your returns. <laughs> this has been a hot button item for a long time, and I, I think something that you hit on that I truly love maybe equal to your beard. I don't know. I'd probably love your beard a little more. Um, but it's, it's the this, winter it's beard this. right now, so it's a bit thicker. Yeah, I, I mean, that's that's what I'm about. Um, so, but it's where it says, you know, lawmakers and their families has the appearance of corruption. I love that because part of it, obviously, is everybody just immediately looks and they're like, that's corruption. And you are giving a more, I think, rational perception of this. You know, not everybody in Congress is necessarily corrupt right out of the gate. Uh, you know, you can argue that either way. But, you know, giving the benefit of the doubt, I like that you highlight the fact that even the appearance of corruption, which I agree with, is detrimental in and of itself. It's the same thing, you know, that we see in uh, private industry. You know, it, my, my wife, she works in, in big law. There's a lot of restrictions oh, yeah. on, you know, especially people in that, that are partners and whatnot. There's all sorts of restrictions on all of them, not necessarily because of direct corruption, but this right here, the appearance of corruption. And you see it in a lot of places. So just talk to me a little bit about your thoughts on this, because I think a lot of people resonate other than me. Like I said, I'm really going to be in big trouble coming up with <laughs> trades after this. So, you know, I'm hoping this gets stopped in its tracks. But, you know, for, for other people that might be interested in equitable and, you know, buzzwords like that, right, um, right, right. What, what are your thoughts here? Look, uh, it, I, I like that you've highlighted that. Uh, I, I certainly think it's corrupt. I think I think you know the corruption is staggering. Uh, mm -hmm. My my point in this is it doesn't even matter if it is if they're corrupt or not. That this exactly. is enough. Just the appearance. Just the yep. appearance. So you know, yeah, that's right. It, it give them the benefit of the doubt. It doesn't matter. You can't. You want someone to change a system that they are, you know, you're, you're depending on the people who benefit the most from the system to change it. And you're probably not going to get very far if you just yell at them at their, in their faces and call them criminals, uh, get them to see that it doesn't even matter if they are or not. That, that right. If we don't trust our, you know, our leaders and we don't trust them to do the right thing and we don't trust them to enter public service because of, you know, that it's service versus a, a gateway to extreme wealth, uh, that's that just attracts all the worst kind of people. And I find 
the response yeah. of politicians, especially who have profited so much from it. What do you mean? It's come part out, of the American economy. Right, right. You know, we're, we're all, you know, we're all part of the market here. Or, you know, some have said, well, you won't attract uh, people into uh, Congress if they can't trade off of that position. Like, are you kidding me? Like, it's the craziest possible reaction. And all I can say is good. I don't want to attract those people, right? Exactly. I want the people who are coming in because they want to serve and they want to try and fix things, even if I don't agree yep. with their views, right? Yep. At, at least they're trying to do the right thing. Uh, and it's probably too much to hope for. It certainly has become in this day and age too much to hope for. But, you know, maybe we can aspire to get back to that. Uh, well, for me, I, I actually like the fact that there's at least, you know, even some bills being introduced. You know, I'm sure some of it might just be kind of for a show. Um, but there, like, I like that there's at least a conversation about it because, you know, as much as my annual PL is going to suffer from this sort of, you know, just huge drop in my strategy. Um, I, I think it really is important, especially because it's exactly as you say, nobody looks at this and whether or not they are actively engaging in corruption and somehow, you know, Nancy Pelosi's husband, who's apparently a fucking genius because the dude's made several hundred million over the last couple of years. Really that's a genius. That's just really good track record. Um, yeah. you, you know, I, I think that the appearance in and of itself is more than enough to go off of. We have really high expectations of the military in a lot of these senses. Um, I, and I, it just blows my mind that it somehow doesn't permeate over to this group because, yeah. you know, uh, apparently capitalism and the economy access applies to certain people and not others. Exactly. And, you know, it's, it's just one of those things. It's, it's a small thing. Um, but a lot of these small things, I think, add up and they're important. Yes. Right. And, and if we want to get back to, you know, a governable country, uh, which I, it feels like the U.S. is not really a governable country at the moment. You know, I think it starts with rooting out corruption and it starts with rooting out, uh, you know, the revolving door and the influence of lobbying and, you know, uh, political and campaign finance reform, all of these things are sort of part and parcel of the same issue, uh, which is to try and get back to, you know, governing a, a country based on what's best versus what's best for the country versus what's best for the individuals that have, you know, attained higher office. And, and so, you know, I'm sure it's naively optimistic to hope we can get there, but, you know, I'll continue to be the naive optimist. Well, you know, don't worry while you're doing that, as soon as this gets struck down and I no longer can put food in my mouth, I'll just send you a bill on a monthly basis. You, know, you just pick me up. You know, Pelosi um, might have a good track record, but most of these politicians actually don't. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it would be great to see this just changed, but um, cool. We're pretty much at time, but I, I definitely want to talk at least a couple minutes about your platform that's coming out. I am so oh, stoked sure, yeah. about it. And, you know, I've, again, just full disclaimer, I, I did invest in it because I, I truly believe in it. I, I love what you guys are doing. Um, but anyways, you know, just what's the latest there? I unfortunately wasn't able to make the town hall last night. Um, I'm looking forward to that recording, but would love, you know, just a two minute recap on what you guys are doing. Yeah, yeah. And, and of course, thank you for the support. You know, it means a lot. Um, we, we just, we take it very seriously. Uh, we, we crowdfunded uh, our funding for this and, you know, that gave us a, a base of investors of uh, over 1,350 and it's an amazing sort of foundation to be building from. And so, you know, our intention is that uh, in about a month, uh, we're going to release an alpha version of it to our investors. Um, and maybe uh, four to six weeks after that, we will open up beta. And so on the web, on the website right now, urban.finance, you can sign up for the beta wait list. If you share your referral link, you can move up the beta wait list to get access earlier. Um, and, you know, what we're going to have even early on, we're just going to have fantastic data sets, uh, the best data of the professional world. Uh, we have secured an excellent sort of commercial uh, arrangement. So it's going to uh, we'll be starting out, it'll have delayed uh, prices because there are processes we have to go through to get approval for showing real time. But ultimately, 
probably by beta, we will have those approvals. And so we will have uh, the highest quality real-time data. We'll have historical intraday data going back seven years. Uh, we will have daily data that goes back to 1960. We will have the best sources of fundamental data and corporate intelligence available. Um, we'll have uh, the kind of real-time news feed that you know CNBC relies on and other trading desks. So you know, from a real-time news perspective, we're investing heavily in that. Uh, so all of these data sources will be coming together to hopefully provide you know a fantastic uh, research experience for people, a way to understand markets. Um, and then it, what, what we hope to build on with that is sort of communities that come together to do due diligence and push, push out research and strategies. Uh, so we see it sort of coming together as a sub stack for financial analysis. Um, and then we're also going to have all sorts of educational resources to help teach people about markets, market structure, awesome. investing, trading, financial literacy, all of this stuff is a, is a real focus of ours. Um, and then the last piece is advocacy, where we're going to really try and be a force in this market structure debate that's going to be happening this year and beyond. And we're going to try and make sure that markets are going to work better for people and be simpler and more transparent. You guys are awesome. I'm, I'm literally super looking forward to it. And again, just for like the sake of pure transparency, like Dave didn't ask me to invest. There was literally nothing there. I, I asked him to look at the platform and I literally just liked it. Like there's no promotional agreement, anything like that. I just want all of that to be super clear because I really go out of my way to just you know, be transparent with people because there's such a lack of that. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm literally so stoked about it. I can't wait to check it out. I think you guys are working on something that's really powerful. I had a chance, you know, to work off of a Bloomberg terminal for a while, which was a really great experience. Yeah. Um, you know, and this seems something that retail traders will benefit from tremendously as well as, you know, probably larger groups as well. And the last thing I definitely want to know is, one of the things that really sold me on you guys early on was kind of that community aspect, because that's one of really my missions with the YouTube channel is to teach people how to learn to trade derivatives and options. Like I love teaching and I love the space. And one of the biggest components of that is teaching people to work together because the collective brain is way smarter than any single it's person. It's so cool, so, right? That yeah. I, I love the hive mind. I'm blown yes. away by the hive mind. And, you know, I think that that uh, that's our exact hope is that we can provide, you know, like a lot of this, uh, a lot of the, the, the hive mind analysis has come out on Reddit, for example, yep. which is a fantastic uh, system, but it's not built for that, you know, right. And so we're going to have a system that is built for that, where you can, you know, do a, a very powerful uh, type of data visualization and analysis. And then you can take the product of that and embed it in a post, for example, uh, and, and share that with people. Others can collaborate. They can, you know, check out what you're doing, change it, you know, offer revisions. Communities can so come awesome. together to develop it. And then you can embed these things so that they continue to update, right? That they're not static uh, illustrations of what you're trying to show, that, they, that they're changing over time as things change over time. So I, I just love the idea of building a platform uh, to let people be creative and work together. And then I don't even know what's going to come out of it, but I, I know it's going to be really cool. Yeah. Well, unlike the current, you know, waiting to see what happens with fed policy. I think this one, we're eager to see how this one pans out. <laughs> I, I agree with you. It's, it, it's going to be something special. So thank you guys for working on that. And as awesome. always, Dave, absolute pleasure talking with you. Thank you for your time. And I'm looking forward to connecting with you again. Yeah. Likewise. Thanks, Eric. It was fun. Take care.